Uh, before we start, I'd like to ask you all a few questions. Uh, you know the drill? Raise your hand if the answer is yes. Uh, how many of you write code? Right? Um, how many of you write tests for your code? Okay. How many of you manage your own infrastructure? Less people. So how many of you use configuration management systems for your uh, infrastructure? One, two, three, four. Um, how many of you have automated testing suites for your configuration automate? Kind of. I'm working on it. This is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, my first idea for this talk was test-driven in infrastructure development, but I thought that was a little bit, it didn't really say what we'd be talking about. Um, so I thought maybe testing your chef cookbooks would be a better title. But then I realized it was Halloween. And there's candy, so you guys should pass around the candy if you want some. Um, and this was probably the best title for tonight's talk. <laughs> and I, my mock Swedish is kind of off, but I think it's Hurdy Dermer Flirpity Flupen is how that's pronounced. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, my name is Dakota Dux. It rhymes with books. Most people, uh, when they meet me and I tell them their name, or my name, uh, they ask me two questions. The first is, uh, is it north or south? And that gets old after a while, so please don't ask me that. <laughs> the second thing is, is that they say, they tell me that their neighbor's dog na is named Dakota. And I usually say, you know, mine is too, uh, and he's a nice little dachshund. Um, you can find me on Twitter at ddux, and I'm a senior, senior engineer at NextPoint. At NextPoint, uh, we offer a software as a service platform that helps corporations, governments, and law firms to address challenges with document management of electronically stored information. We're known for social media collections, electronic evidence management, and electronic discovery. Uh, we have three products, the first being cloud preservation which archives your social media platforms and your websites. Uh, our, second pla our second product is Discovery Cloud, which is an integration, integrated processing and review platform. And our last product is Trial Cloud, which is a trial practice software. And when I say practice, I mean not practicing to get better at something, but practice as in you're doing something. Um, so here's a brief, brief overview of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, you know, what is Chef, what tools can we use to test Chef, and we'll talk about some of the tools that Chef has. Um, so first of all, what is Chef? Chef is kind of a poorly named software project. Naming parts of the framework, things like cookbooks, recipe, and knife, make it very hard to Google. <laughs> Seriously, it's really hard to find things when you're looking for it. Um, you always have to append ops code, which is a company that Road Chef to all of your search strings. Um, however, it is really awesome if you like puns. All the gems seem to be named with cooking utensils and things like that. So let's get cooking. Chef is an open source Ruby project created by OpsCode. It dynamically generates configuration on a machine allowing us to run applications. In short, Chef is a way of translating infrastructure into code. What does that mean, though? Infrastructure into code. It takes something that's somewhat physical, your, your machine and your configuration machine, and makes it in, and allows you to use things like version control to really uh, to control what you're doing with your machine. So you can take things like branching, you can take things like revisions, and you can, you can use these on your machines. So you can set up different machines in different ways or revert machines to back or forward or branch. Um, another thing that it means is it means you can reuse the infrastructure just like you can reuse code. So you can share cookbooks between servers. Um, you know, maybe you have a uh, all-in-one one full stack server for your web app. You know, it's got your database, it's got your web app, it's got Apache, it's got Rails on it and you've just gotten too big. You know, it's too big for that server and you don't want to scale vertically. So you scale horizontally. You can pull out the recipes that, and the code that you've used to set up your database and push that to a database server. You can take 
the code that you've used to set up your Apache and Rails and push that to another database. And you can share your user configurations between both servers. It's kind of cool when you think about it because you're configuring machines through code, which I'm sure we've done before in the past with Bash, but it's a lot easier now. Um, at the highest level, chef code is grouped into cookbooks. Cookbooks are used to organize all the code for a specific concern. For example, a MySQL cookbook has all the code to install the, the default version of MySQL. It also has the code to install Percona MySQL and also the code to install MySQL on an EC2 because on an EC2 you install MySQL on a different server so that you can save it on an EBS block. You can pick and choose which, which recipe, which piece of code you want to run on your server and, but it's all grouped together in the MySQL cookbook. Cookbooks obviously contain recipes. I mean, what else would you call something in a cookbook? Uh, recipes are written in the Chef DSL and encapsulate collections of resources for setting your server. So recipes are kind of like the fundamental pieces of your code for Chef. Sidebar. Now, everyone knows what a DSL is? Domain specific language? Um, Funniest thing I read while researching was that Java is a DSL for creating stack traces. <laughs> so, back to the talk. Uh, resources are Chef's fundamental objects. They can take action, but they aren't an object on the server, which is kind of confusing to all of us object-orientated programmers. Uh, if we have a user resource, it can create a user, but it is not the user, which is kind of a different way of thinking about things. When we think in object-oriented terms, we say a user does something, not, not in the way that we think of a resource where a resource creates something. Um, and I said that wrong. But the, the user object can only create things. It is not something on the server. And then resources work with providers. Providers take a resource, compare that resource to the current state of the machine that it's managing and takes action specified in the resource. They are the way that Chef supports multiple platforms. So you can write a recipe and it'll work on Ubuntu and it'll work on Apache or it'll work on CentOS and it'll work on Mac and it'll work all with the same code and all you need to do is specify the resource. So the provider takes the resource, it takes the abstract requirement, which in, in our case right now would be install Apache, and it converts that into an action. So the action would be yum install Apache, or apt-get install Apache, or brew install Apache. So you can write a cookbook, uh, and you can write a recipe that, and just tell it to install Apache, and it will work on any server that you want, if you do it right. Uh, this is a diagram of the chef run. So there are five steps to the chef run. The first is building the node, where, and this is where uh, chef dynamically grabs all of the uh, information about the server that you're running at that point in time. It grabs the kernel, uh, grabs kernel information, it grabs the version of the operating system you're running, and it stores that in a, um, in a hash, which is combined with any previous runs, of, any previous runs data, so if you've already run da uh, Chef on the server and you're running a Chef server, it'll store that on the Chef server. And it'll also combine that with any sp uh, specific attributes or inputs that you give the server on startup for your Chef run. Um, so the next step is uh, syncing, which pulls down all the cookbooks from your Chef repository uh, or your Chef server. Next is uh, compile, which puts the code together based on the current configuration of the server. And this is kind of weird because this isn't actually installing things, but it's putting together the code to install things. So when you compile something, it takes the information that it has on the server and it, it says, I'm going to need to run in yum install Apache, for instance, because it knows that it's on a server that has yum installed. So it will then set up the commands to install Apache later on uh, in the configure uh, step, which is the next step. Finally, um, so the, in the, during the configuration step, 
you actually compile and install all the libraries or in the code that you're looking to install, services or resources. And finally, there's a notification handler step, which um, notifies other resources to take action. For instance, you may change a specific syslog configuration file for your web app, and you need to notify syslog to restart after you've changed that configuration file. So next, we're going to talk about some Chef development tools. The first will be Food Critic, followed by Vagrant, and then Berkshelf. Food Critic is a linting tool, uh, or it's categorized as one. Uh, linting tools are used to determine if your code follows specs, it looks appropriate. Um, you know, but Food Critic can be used for more than just making sure your DSL code conforms to best practices. It also makes it easier to flag problems in your cookbook that would cause Chef to blow up when you attempt to converge. For instance, uh, if we run Food Critic, uh, it may spit out an error for number 45. Consider setting a name for your cookbook in the metadata file. So if we look at our metadata file, um, metadata has a name. If we didn't have this name here, Food Critic would blow up. Can you make it bigger? Yeah. Um, so if we didn't have this name here, Food Critic would give us a warning. So Food Critic tells us right away. Uh, we can comment this out and run. Or not. So consider setting a cookbook name in the metadata. Um, if we have it there, it doesn't give us any information. Now, that was really quick. In a chef run, if we didn't know that that metadata, that name wasn't there in the metadata file, it could take an hour after the server configured. <laughs> So another another thing would be something like this. Food Critic says execute resource used to run curl or wget commands. Uh, so right now in our recipe, we're using the execute resource here to change directories into temp and use w to get to pull down the file at example.org and action.run and just and run this action. Um, so this really doesn't do anything wrong, but it also doesn't spit out any information to the command line. So if we want to do it the right way, we have a remote file resource that would pull down the information just like our cd temp and wget uh, command through execute, but it would do it with <laughs> more chef style, more chef flair, and it would also log all the information. So we'd, we'd much rather use the remote file resource than the execute resource. All right. Um, you can also write your own shell. Like Food Critic comes with a bunch of rules that it likes you to conform to, but you can write your own rules for it as well. Uh, Etsy does a lot of them. Uh, you know, For instance, you may want to have only allow hashes in your cookbooks that are 1.9 style instead of 187. I don't know why you'd want that, but you know, you could do that. The next tool we're going to talk about is Vagrant. Vagrant is awesome. Um, it allows you to easily start, maintain, and clean up virtual machines on your dev environment. Um, you can use a Vagrant file to configure how many of what kind of boxes you want to start. Um, which recipes you want to run on those boxes and what kind of inputs you want to use on those boxes. Um, in short, it lets you run those machines that you have out there in the cloud or in the server room in the back or even on Bob's uh, computer down the hall. It lets you run them here on your dev machine, which is really cool 
because in a lot of cases it takes a long time to start up real machines. So um, it's, it's worth checking out if you're in this space. Um, some relevant vagrant commands. Up starts the machine and runs chef if you tell it to. Provision will run chef. Uh, you can vagrant SSH to log into a box. Uh, halt will shut down the box and then leave it there. Destroy will shut down, down the box and remove any leftovers. And status will return the current state of the server. So we'll check out our box right now. We've got a vagrant box sitting here. Powered off so we can vagrant up. And it'll start up. It's going to take a few seconds. Um, let's look at the vagrant file quick while we're waiting for that to boot up. Um, in the vagrant file, you can supply a host name. You can supply a specific virtual machine box, which you have locally on your server. And if you don't have it, you can give a URL. And it'll audit, Vagrant will automatically pull down that virtual machine box and allow you to uh, and set everything up for you. You can specify specific private network IPs. So on my, in my browser, I can go to 33, 33, 33, 10, and I can see what's running there or I can SSH into there if I wanted to. Um, you can supply the JSON, which is the inputs for Chef. So here, I'm not running MySQL, but if I were running MySQL, you could see my passwords. Um, it's me starting up with a, ser a root server password of root pass. Um, and then this last piece here is the run list. So this is the set of recipes that would run on the uh, virtual machine startup. So uh, the machine has started up now. Uh, if we can do a vagrant status and check it out. Um, but you can see the run. Here we've got Berkshelf, which is what we'll talk about next. Um, and then the server setup itself. And then the chef run runs down here. So nothing really happened. And the server is running. We can use vagrant. SSH to log into the box. Do you mind boosting this back a little bit? Sure. Okay. Better? More? Oh, Better for me. That's good. Okay, so um, this is this is actually a virtual machine from we use a company called Rightscale to host our to help us manage our servers on EC2. So this is the uh, actual machine that they use when they're setting up their instances. So I can run that right here, which is kind of cool. Um, I can see who I am, Vagrant on this box, um, and that's about it with Vagrant for now. Um, so next we're going to talk about Berkshelf. Berkshelf is like bundler for cookbooks. Before Berkshelf was around, um, it was a pain in the butt to deal with cookbooks that other people have written. You would have to get check them out, and then you'd have this behemoth library, and there really was no way to manage things. So Berkshelf came uh, around. It's written by Riot Games, who you guys may know the game League of Legends. League of Legends. Um, they wrote it in order to help deal with their DevOps stuff. Uh, they got some pretty cool projects around it, and they've got pretty cool projects as a whole. Um, if you're setting up a new cookbook, use Bundler to set it up. You can, use, you can use Bundle Cookbook, and it'll set up a whole new cookbook for you with every, all the goodness you need. It, comes, it sets up Vagrant, it sets up your test kitchen, it sets up all your gem files, it sets up everything that you need to run, uh, to run Chef. Okay. So, on to the main course. Is it Bort? We write code. It's what we do. Our, our code provides value to our users, whether they be our employers, clients, or other community members who reuse our code. One way we can determine if our work is valuable is asking the essential question, is it Bort? Imagine with me now, you go home tonight, and somehow I've inspired you to, to set up some configuration management for your servers. So you start by typing up a recipe. You're happy as a clam. You've read all of the chef documentation and you feel good about how things are going. You remember to use Vagrant and you start up your virtual box. 
and you wait. You wait for your server to complete booting. Your recipes don't do too many things, and your server only takes a few minutes to boot up, but it does seem like forever. It eventually boots up. You log into your server, you use Vagrant SSH. Everything's going well. But it's borked. Your recipes uh, didn't match. You misspelled the name of a directory. And so because you misspelled that name, everything went wrong. But the chef run didn't fail because it can do that, because you told it to do what it did. Um, so what we have to do is we have to make our response cycle quicker. We need to get from red to green to refactor faster. Our goal is to make chef development feel like this. <laughs> so we can do that to an extent with uh, test-driven development with Test Kitchen and Chef Spec. Um, however, you know when you're installing something like Ruby, if you're uh, compiling Ruby or through RBMV or something like that, it's going to take a while. There's not a lot you can do about it. Um, so we're going to talk about Chef Spec and Test Kitchen. Chef Spec is a unit testing framework for Chef, and Test Kitchen is an integration. Uh, testing framework. Um, so chef, chef spec is used to, uh, is, it's, it gives you very quick responses, but like all unit tests, it mocks things out. It doesn't actually go through the full chef convergence. So when you run chef spec, it doesn't actually do anything. It pretends. Um, but you can do a lot with chef spec pretending. Uh, you can you can definitely find out if you're including things or if you're doing what you're, if you think you're doing things right, but you can't tell if things have actually fully completed. So we're going to look at uh, the a chef a default uh, chef spec file here. Um, it should you guys anybody have experience with our spec? So it should look pretty familiar, right? It yeah. should look, in fact, very familiar. Uh, chef spec is chef and our spec. Um, they've uh, chef. It's it's our spec made to work with chef. Um, the first so describe looks familiar. Uh, the next line is uh, creates a, a mock chef runner, so it's fake, um, and it fakely converges while running this recipe. With the default, the described recipe is the described recipe, um, and. In this case, our test is going to say it's going to make sure we include the recipe awesome prompt installer, and we're going to expect Chef Run to include awesome prompt install. And we do that by expecting Chef Run to include the recipe awesome prompt installer. And then we're also going to check to see if user local foo.txt has the text foo in it. So We've got two failures. It's red. Um, so let's look at our default recipe. Our default recipe is, has, currently has a lot of stuff commented out because I am scared to live code things. <laughs> so uh, we will uncomment our first thing, which is the include recipe for awesome prompt installer. And then we will exec our spec. Two examples, one failure. So it's good. Um, for those of you who aren't experienced with uh, with Chef, this include recipe says let's run this other this recipe. So you can include a recipe from another recipe, another cookbook, or another recipe. Um, another recipe in the same cookbook. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use this resource, which is the cookbook file resource, which takes a file within your cookbook directory, which is foo.txt, and it will, it will put this file 
in the user local foo.txt uh, location on the server. So if we do bundle exec r spec here, we're green. So we could refactor this, we could change user local foo to be somewhere else so that we're not using, uh, we could, we're not using just random locations on the server, which we should do, but we're gonna ignore that for now. Um, so we changed a few things here, right? Um, so let's run our cookbook. Let's run Vagrant again. So let's go back to Vagrant and provision it. Which will only run the cookbook now that we've changed it. So you can see that we've run, we've created a cookbook file bash login somewhere else. We've created a foo.txt. And so if we vagrant, if we SSH into the server, you can see our super awesome test, <laughs> our super awesome prompt. Work, work, work. Cool. So uh, our test works, right? Let's comment these out again. because we're going to move forward. Um, the thing about ChefSpec is that it doesn't test everything. So you may say foo.txt, but since it doesn't actually put that, it doesn't actually create that file, foo.txt, it may change in between, something else may change it, or uh, something may get in the way of it passing your test outside of ChefSpec. ChefSpec will say it's green, something else will say it's red. And that's something else, is test, test Kitchen. Uh, test kiss, Kitchen is a convergent test harness for configuration management systems. So I say configuration management systems. You can use this for Chef or Puppet or anything else. Um, it allows you to easily spin up a server, run your recipes, verify that your recipes work, uh, and rerun your recipes as needed. So it allows you to bring up the server, actually converge what you need, and test very quickly, and then get rid of the server when you're done with it. Uh, we'll look at uh, kitchen init, which is what happens when you create, when you set up a cookbook to work with test kitchen, creates a kitchen YAML file, which is the kitchen configuration file, and then a test directory, which is where all your tests live. So we'll look at the kitchen.yaml file. Kitchen.yaml um, has a bunch of settings. So in this case, we've got a driver plugin for Vagrant. If we wanted to use something else like LXC, we could use that here. Um, and then it has a list of platforms. So right now we've got our right image Ubuntu 1204 box. We could also uncomment the rest of these lines and have a normal Ubuntu 1204 box or a Cent OS box. Um, and Test Kitchen, if we don't have those boxes on our server, will automatically pull them down for us and make them usable. Um, and then we have a, a set of suites, um, you know, so we can run a default suite or if we have a MySQL suite on this server, this, uh, in this cookbook, we could have a different suite for that. Um, and we have a run list of our basic Mad Railers recipe, our default Mad Railers recipe. So if I were to uncomment all of these lines here for all the different platforms, Chef would go through and test every single one of them or a test kitchen would go through and test every single one of them for us, which can take some time. But we can also run it in parallel, so it will test all of them in parallel, so things will speed up quite significantly, which is pretty cool. Um, test kitchen takes long, because it's actually doing the work, right? So like, if you're installing <coughs> Ruby, like I said, it could take an hour. It doesn't take an hour, it takes like 30 minutes, but, um, if you're, so it, it takes a long time, but when you're done, you get what the server would look like when it's out there running in the cloud or in your backroom server or on Bob's laptop over in the corner. It's the whole enchilada. You want to use this if you're developing, uh, if you're developing infrastructure. Uh, so we'll talk about the test kitchen lifecycle. So it's a lot like Vagrant. There's a lot of things that should be similar. Create is just like Vagrant up. Converge is just like provision, 
Uh, setup sets everything up to run your tests. Verify runs your tests, and then destroy gets rid of everything. So let's go test it out. And since uh, Test Kitchen will run, if, if I specify verify, it'll run all of the recipes before that. So it'll take us to where we need to be without doing them one by one, because that would be painful. So this takes a little bit, not too long. You can see right now it's setting up Busser, which we'll talk about in a second. Or we can talk about it now. Um, busser is another play on culinary words. It's short for busboy. Um, it's kind of ridiculous that they use all these terms, but it's also kind of awesome. Um, busser takes is the thing that installs all of your test libraries. So um, let's go back a step. Um, here is our the directory for our test integration suite, Test Kitchen. Um, we have a, the, we've got test and integration, which is what we're doing. The next directory down is suite. So if we have bar, or here we have bar and default. So we have a bar suite, which we could also have like a MySQL suite if we were installing MySQL on the server, and we could have an Apache suite if we were installing Apache on the server. Basically, it's a way to split up your concerns within your cookbooks. Um, and then underneath that, we have Busser. So Busser is the name of the uh, utility you're using for testing. In this case, we have a mini test Busser and a BATS tester. Uh, BATS is short for, what is it, BASH. Uh, Bash automated test system. So you can write code in Bash. Um, so we've got red here. Um, but let's talk about our tests first before we go back to that. Uh, here is an example of our mini test, which look, should look pretty familiar for anyone who's used mini test. Uh, we have a Mad Railers default describe, and we make sure it's created a foo.txt the file exists. Pretty straightforward. And then here's our bats file. Uh, bats is bash and basically it says the text is foo. Text foo is in user local foo.txt uh, which you can argue that that test description isn't the best but because we know that the contents of foo.txt is change me to foo. So um, our first test has failed. Our test default bats has failed. So let's change that up. We're going to go to our default recipe again and set up the cookbook file, user foo.txt. And since we, so now we can run this again. We actually need to converge it before we verify. Our, our server's already, our virtual machine is already set up to have the bussers in it already, so we don't need to reinstall, we don't need to rerun the setup. I guess it does though. This ran a lot quicker this morning. We might be on. I came here this morning and tested on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> the uh, 
This took about, uh, it didn't take very long. It took two minutes to run the whole test suite here. And I think we're coming on that pretty soon for one small piece. So, text foo is in user local foo.txt, so it passes. So, why is this important at next point? The next point, we have clients that store highly sensitive legal data in our system. Um, so we try to give them each single tenant resources where we can, uh, which means we bring servers up and down a lot uh, because we scale for individual clients. Uh, we use EC2, so it's really easy. Um, client is processing a large data set will scale up and when they're done processing that will scale down uh, it's it is wasteful but it's something that our clients really appreciate because it gives them security and it gives them a feeling that their stuff isn't anywhere near anyone else's stuff which again you could argue that they're on virtual machines so technically they're right next to someone else's information but that's a different argument um, since they're, we're starting and stopping things so quickly and frequently, we use Chef to make sure everything is set up correctly, our servers are set up correctly. Uh, much like candy wrappers, our servers deliver the gooey goodness of our application and allow us to toss them out without worrying about trashing something of value. Any questions? Yes? So, how you use Chef from like a, a server uh, profile, right? Not Chef Solo. Uh, you use them both, actually. Okay. So uh, there are a couple different flavors of Chef. We actually have kind of like a weird hybrid that we use with RightScale, um, because they have basically there are these things called attributes or data bags, and data bags are a way for you to store um, information about what you're doing, like uh, private keys. But you can encrypt that information or uh, what version of what uh, what version of MySQL you want to install? Um, but uh, RightScale kind of mocks that out for us, so we use that in that way. But you can do it basically does the same thing that Chef uh, Server does. Okay. So, but if you were looking to, yeah. So, I guess. I guess I was asking. I, <clears throat> I've tried to get up and running on Chef before. Had a lot of problems yeah. with getting solo to work. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the documentation online assumes that you have a, a chef master server line around. Yes. Um, do you have any suggestions of like resources to look at to get started with Chef Solo? Um, I don't on offhand, but I can definitely give it to you. Uh, I can give you them. It's uh, it is a hard learning curve. Uh, things don't make sense. Uh, like we talk. Uh, we briefly talked about resources and providers. You call a resource, but the provider decides what resource to use. So, okay. like, it's, it's things don't line up correctly. And no offense to dev or to ops guys, but some of the things just don't make sense in a dev world. You know, some of the things, the way, so a lot of the things, the way things work, don't make sense in a dev, dev world. Um, so it, it is, there is a very steep learning curve, but once you get over it, once you kind of understand things, then there are other things with steep learning curves. <laughs> Which is, is not, uh, it's not encouraging, but when you get things going, it's really powerful. It's really powerful. So what I would do, there is a, uh, actually there's a talk called uh, The Burke Shelf Way. Um, that's really good. Okay. I'd recommend that one. Um, and he, it's, it's done by the guy who wrote Burke Shelf, and he works for League of Legends, and he's, uh, it's, inter it's, it's a definite change in the old way, because there's a lot of old Chef documentation that's crusty. Okay. And if you're looking to do TDD with Chef, there's also um, some really good art, um, blog posts that were written by Seth Vargo at Ops Code, yep. um, who is really opinionated about how to do TDD with Chef in particular. He's a heavy contributor to Test Kitchen, um, and his main concern is that people aren't testing what Chef or what the uh, unit tests for Chef itself already test. And so yes. Yeah. I, I actually gave a lot of really bad examples here, um, but I wanted something that was really simple. 
Well, um, I mean, this didn't go too far into that at all either. So. Yeah. So, like, one of the things that Seth talks about is you don't want to test Chef. You don't want to test to make sure that Chef works. So, testing that a, a you know a cookbook file resource creates a file is a bad test. You know, it's like anything. You can write good tests and you can write bad tests. Um, so he talks about you want to make sure that the things you're testing are of actual business. If you, if you guys have any questions about it, feel free to contact me and ask away. I think it's a, it's really cool and it's something that I think we're going to see a lot more of in the future. Cool. I, I happened to walk in just as you were mentioning curl. Yeah. So I didn't catch the first part of that paragraph. Okay. Uh, so we were talking about uh, Food Critic at the time, and Food, food Critic is a linting tool. And basically, in Chef, you don't want to use this block here. Uh, because it's executing uh, code, it's executing bash code, so you don't uh, actually get any of the kind of the chef niceness. It doesn't log anything, it doesn't do any of that kind of the fanciness. Um, you want to use uh, remote file instead, which will take care of curl for you, or if you're sure you're going to test curl, 